You're watching Beyond Market. Welcome, I'm Esther Awuni. Many thanks for joining us. On today's show, we'll discuss what the future holds for Nigeria's petroleum industry. As always, you can join the conversation with the hashtag Beyond Market. And you can send your thoughts, your comments to my Twitter handle. It's at Esther O. Awuni. Now, making the future projections for Nigeria's petroleum industry becomes increasingly difficult as global concerns on the future of fossil fuels continues to grow. Recently, the European Investment Bank proposed to end all fossil fuel financing by the year 2020, and this pressure is spreading across the financial world. So how should Nigeria strategize for the future of its highly treasured petroleum industry? Debo Fagbemi, the chairman of the Nigeria Council for the Society of Petroleum Engineers, joins me for this discussion. Debo, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you. Quite interesting how things are evolving uh, within the oil and gas space and also as it relates to funding. But let's talk about this issue on fossil fuels. What we're hearing right now is that the Inv European Investment Bank is going to cut, uh, stop funding to uh, new fossil projects and is looking to more long-term clean energy projects. But we, while that is happening, we also know that for the World Bank, where we get a lot, a lot of funding, especially through the uh, uh, IFC, they continue to invest heavily in these fossil fuels. So my question is, as a country, uh, the mainstay in oil, should we begin to have these conversations, at least to prepare ourselves for the, you know, the, the, the possibility that this could happen one day? Yeah, absolutely, I think we should. And uh, you know, over at SP, uh, I think April it was in this year, we had uh, a conversation around this particular subject where we discussed uh, energy security and sustainability okay. in the oil and gas industry and what the future, future portends for the industry. Uh, that was at one of our events in Abuja, the uh, energy forum and uh, a lecture you know, where we thoroughly dissected the issues. And clearly, uh, the energy mix is changing right right now, uh, even though there's still a space for oil and gas. You know, oil in the next uh, 10 years, 2030, we're going to be having roughly 37% uh, you know, um, share of the energy mix. And then gas is going to have a 27% share of the, of, of the mix. So in a combined from the oil and gas industry, it's going to, I mean, muscle out about 60% of the, uh, energy space as far as energy mix is concerned. But we still need to look at the fossil fuels and the renewables, yeah, you know, as closely as possible because things are switching in the area of wind technology, uh, solar mm -hmm. as well, as well as, uh, you know, other green sources of energy that the industry is uh, looking at. So obviously, yeah. I mean, sustainability is the issue here. Absolutely. But for yeah. you industry players, yeah. you know, obviously I know that for the way Nigeria's oil and gas industry is structured, there's yeah. always that constant engagement between uh, players, stakeholders and the government because the that's government right. is a key player too. Yeah, that's right. But I'm just wondering, uh, we, if these, these conversations have started already, can we begin to, maybe by way of policy, yeah begin to at least begin to put that structure in place, so at least put it yeah. in some kind of document to say that, okay, fine, at this point, or let's have a target or a timeline that we can begin to make this, actually make this, actually make this shift for, yeah. for ourselves. You know, there has to be a targeted approach to it, you know, and that is what we recommended at the end of our event in April, you okay. know, because we came out of the communique with a list of uh, about 10 point uh, recommendations to governments, you know, we might, I mean, we have some, some M MDAs that are already focused you know, we have a renewable energy under an NPC. Okay, okay. Yeah, you know, and uh, some of these um, agencies are already forcing the conversations already. But the fact is that if you look at the industry at large, you know, all the, across the entire value chain of the industry, mm -hmm. from upstream to downstream, right, every component of your operations should be get towards having a renewable or green energy strategy in place. Otherwise, you're only going to be chasing shadows, as it were. Okay, so yeah. would you say that the government is open to this? The government, Absolutely. the body language is, okay, we yeah. are open to this. Things are changing, time, times are changing, we are open. I will say so because at, at that event, we had the GMD, the then GMD of NMPC, um, um, Dr. Mekans Barrow. He was there, he gave a keynote address, and it was yeah. clear from uh, his body language and, you know, the message that he, he brought to the event that clearly the government is looking you know, closely at, at uh, some of these things, yeah. Okay, well, yeah. that is good to know. Yeah. Let's uh, quickly talk about uh, another issue within the industry, and that is data. What yeah. can you tell us in terms of how we are, how this is emerging within the Nigerian yeah. oil and gas space? Well, the, 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 to be honest, as, as an industry, uh, the oil and gas industry has been a slow adopter of data and digitalization, right? So the conference we had in SPE, which ended two days ago, uh, the Nigerian Annual International Conference and Exhibition, was actually focused on big data. Okay. So the theme of the conference was big data 
artificial intelligence and mobile okay. technology. So we had conversations that were looking at what the operational issues were in terms of migrating to a data mindset within the industry, as well as what the strategic options are you know, for implementing this change. So when you look at it in, in, the, in the whole context of what we have to do, we're looking at um, introducing uh, a, a digitalizing strategy that is going to ensure that the industry is going to take advantage of opportunities where other uh, industries like banking, for instance, mm -hmm. the finance sector, agriculture, health, you know, education have done maybe like 10 years ago so that we can now use this to improve business processes, take better decisions and improve our efficiencies. But do you already see this happening uh, in other countries, all, pro all producers, perhaps within the continent or outside of the continent, that perhaps are already seeing it changing the way, you know, they're becoming more efficient or just the way it changes their operations? No, absolutely. The oil and gas industry is a global industry. Uh -huh. You know, so the standards are quite global and the standards we maintain in Nigeria are equally global. You know, so we have international oil companies that operate here in Nigeria that have, you know, coverage across the entire globe. And a lot of the best practices that we have outside of Nigeria are also being inherited here yeah. and put into practice. So by and large, I would say that um, the, the, the industry is receptive towards it, right? And the conversations we had suggest to me that all stakeholder groups, be it government, the producers, the, um, the operators, the service companies, are all embracing data as the way to go to change business processes. Well, my question yeah. is, because many times, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, while these conferences obviously are, are valuable and, mm. you know, uh, can be quite eye-openers, mm. I'm just wondering, sometimes, you know, these, some players just go away and nothing gets done. So I'm just yeah. wondering, putting pen to paper or ensuring that there's monitoring and that we're actually getting on board yeah. this data. Yeah, very, very good point to raise there. You know, um, our platforms in SPE, uh, for every single event that we organize, we always come out with a communicate. Okay. You know, our communicate not only just goes into the dailies. This year, we intend to issue communicates to every single um, CEO of any stakeholder company or organization that you have within the industry. And if you look at the industry in the last 20 years, SP platforms have actually driven a whole lot of um, activities for change within the industry. I'll mention two of them. Okay. One is our, our venture into marginal field uh, operations in Nigeria. It was the SP uh, platform that created that awareness and made those recommendations to government at the time. That is one. Our uh, foray into deep water exploration was also an initiative that was created within the, um, the, the realms of an SP uh, event as okay. well. Yeah. Most or at every point in time at the heart of this industry yeah. is investment, especially for a country like Nigeria. There's still mm -hmm. room for you know, more exploration, etc regardless of what's going on on the global uh, oil front. Now, we've heard uh, top uh, you know, oil minister, we've heard uh, you know, oil, um, oil office officials tell us that look, there's more room for investment and we're expecting more, and especially in the next two years. And I know that that continues to be a bone of contention. We're not getting the, 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 the significant amount of investments, the investments that we need actually to move the needle within this industry. What yeah. are those bottlenecks? And for you as a player, what is changing now? Yeah, uh, in, in terms of investments, I think the critical thing here is to create the right kind of climate or environment to attract foreign direct investment into the country. Now, uh, we have what you, I mean, I'm sure you've heard about the petroleum industry and governance bill. Okay. Now, this has been ad adopted by the National Assembly, but it's not yet been signed into law. Now, that could be a critical factor, you know, in, 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 in watching how the the, I mean, uh, foreign investors, prospective in investors, look at the climate in the country because nobody's going to come and put money down in your country without an assurance of uh, mm -hmm. return on investment on the long term or in the medium term. So I think that the, the most important thing for us is to create an environment of accountability, fair, fair play, a level playing field, to be able to have, uh, assure foreign investors that when they bring their money in here, you know, there is something for them at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Well, that is for you on, on your yeah. own side as, yeah. as a player. But, yeah. you know, when we hear the government speak, yeah. the NMPC speak, the, the, the language is, look, you know, we're open, we're ready, the environment is, 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 is conducive enough, we're expecting as high as $25 billion uh, US dollars in investments in the next two years, now is the time to invest, now is the time to, to bring in these investments. So I'm just wondering, where is that disconnect? Yeah, you know, you, you, it's, it's not about wishful thinking, right? The, the, the industry today, or in fact the world today, the global economy, right, relies on data. 
right? If you look at data, Nigeria comes out sometimes as an outlier, right? In mm -hmm. that, in terms of statistics, that this is not necessarily an investor-friendly climate. That perception has to change. And, you know, in, the, in our industry, you know, like I told you, the, our standards are global. We tend to maintain global standards and global appeal, you know, to within the ambience of the industry. But in terms of the government, the government needs to walk their talk. It's not to say that, oh, bring your money, come and invest, but more to be able to put in enabling environments and processes to be able to assure and build the confidence of prospective yeah. investors. Okay, so, yeah. so far this year, we're in August now, we're actually yeah. approaching the end of the year. Has there been any significant uh, um, final investment decisions, Any anything of, of worthy of note that's happened, deals within the industry? Yeah, I think I think uh, one or two of the IOCs, mm. yeah, I know, I know of total off the roof of my head, you know, they've been able to um, arrive at FDI in one of their uh, projects, you know. But generally, by and large, you know, I'm even looking on, on that's on the grander scale. Okay. But on the grand last scale, there are a whole lot of, you know, one, one comment that was made by uh, the president of uh, SP International, who was at our conference, was that the level of activity in the industry in Nigeria, right, in terms of the service industry, is actually dominated by Nigerian service companies. That doesn't happen anywhere in Africa. Or even in the Middle East. But that hasn't always yeah. been the case also. We actually yeah. did see that shift. That, that's correct, yes. Time. yeah. I mean, f 10, 15, 20 years ago, you probably would not see a Nigerian service company, right, operating, you know, on its own without a foreign partner. But now, from what this gentleman said, you see that a lot of, I mean, when you look at the exhibitors that came to for our conference, a lot of them, probably 90% of them were owned and run by Nigerians, owned and managed by Nigerians. You know, that says a lot. So these are folks where if they want to now partner, because don't forget that we are still at the infancy stage of the service industry, okay. but we need to partner with OEMs, that's original equipment manufacturers, okay. um, uh, license holders for software and stuff like that. And for you to be able to do that, still you need to assure them that when they come into Nigeria, right, there is a level playing field for them to operate as they would if they were outside of the country or okay. the continent. Yeah. Okay. So I feel that uh, the investments you know, should trickle down all the way, you know, to the small fries, the people at the bottom of the food chain, you know, and there are quite a number of them that needs to be encouraged. Okay, Debo, yeah. thank you for your time so far. We're just going to pause here and okay, pick up from where we left off. I've been speaking thank to Debo Fagbami. He's the chairman of the Nigerian Council of S the Society of Petroleum Engineers, and we're looking at Nigeria's oil and gas industry. We we'll continue after this short break to join us. Marcus, if you're just joining us, Debo Fagbami, the chairman of the Nigerian Council of the Society of Petroleum Engineers, is with me today, and we're exploring what the future holds for Nigeria's petroleum industry. Debo, thank you for your time so far. Thank you. I want to speak from where we left off. We're talking about you know, the service providers within the in industry and the fact mm -hmm. that we have seen more local participation, more, uh, more Nigerians, and of yeah. course, uh, a lot of of Kudus has gone to the NC uh, DMB. Now, but I want to talk about capacity within the industry, mm. especially for those guys, I mean, s skills. I know that that was an issue for a very long time. Mm. What is your assessment in terms of how we progress so far? Yeah, it's a, a bit of mixed feelings, mm. right? You know, for, for me, uh, you know, local content or Nigerian content, you know, has to do with the quantum of entrepreneurial abilities that is residing within the country. Now, the, the model, you know, in the past has always been one of agency arrangements, where you have a a Nigerian sets up a company in Nigeria, mm. then he has a foreign partner outside of the country, and then he gets a contract, and the foreign partner comes into the country to execute the contract. Bringing in skills, technical yeah, know-how, and all of exactly, that. Exactly, okay? yeah. So, I mean, it costs X amount of money to execute that contract, and then the guy gets paid, and then the, he puts a markup on it, he pays off the foreign partner, and then he keeps the markup on top of it, and that's it. He's okay. But for me, you know, in terms of building capacity, touching on what you just mentioned, has to do with knowledge and skills transfer to allow it to reside within the hands of Nigerians. And that for me is what the local content uh, conversation should focus on. So in other words, you are not just bringing a foreign company to the country, but you are bringing a company who is going to train and empower your own people, you know, Nigerians that is, to be able to function and work effectively as they would where they can't pass anywhere else in the world. So if we keep yeah. up the current pace in the next 10, 15 years, what would the, what would the whole the landscape look like? No, I think I think it's in the, probably we will have at least eighty percent compliance. You yeah. know, in terms of uh, local content. Local, yeah. local content. Yeah, uh, correct, well. yes. Okay, that's good to know. Let's talk yeah. quickly talk about, of course, this gas flowing commercialization pro yeah. program, yeah. Uh, recent developments. Uh, uh, the government has approved 
uh, has approved it. I know that initially there were 850 interested parties mm -hmm. uh, registered that registered interest. And what we have in latest uh, info is that uh, 205 applicants have emerged as successful attaining the past status. Just bring us up to speed on how this program is progressing so far, the yeah. interest we've seen, and the ability, of course, capacity to, to ensure that this works out. Yeah, first and foremost, I must commend the federal government yeah. for adopting this uh, approach, you know, to end gas flaring. A lot of, uh, I mean, in, in the last 10 years, we've been having end gas flaring by 20, 10, 20, whatever it is. However, the flare gas commercial pro uh, program has introduced a commercial flavor you know, to the, I mean, so it's a, it's a win-win for everybody. Now, what government says is that they've identified 170 flare sites across the entire country, okay. right? So um, for any flare that you have, right, the, the government has gasseted, gasseted into law, uh, you know, that it belongs to the government if you have not been able to utilize it or converted it into a product of value. So all of these flare sites have been put into a basket, the pool, where you've now invited uh, any interested party or entity you know, Nigerian or foreign, to come and bid for it. So right now, the uh, from 800, we're down to 200 and something odd numbers. Two right? five, okay. Yeah, and uh, those have qualified based on what you call the statement of qualification. So this is like a pre-qualification stage. So now the next step, obviously, I think August 19th in Abuja, they're going to invite these parties to now come and tender their technical commercial proposals, you know, as to what they have to offer. But you must be able to demonstrate that you're technically competent and that you're able to have uh, a sustainable a project that is going to have a socio-economical impact on the operating environment that you're looking at. Yes, so yes. I think it's quite good. I mean, it's going to, mm -hmm. it's one way where legislation has failed, right? I think the commercial um, attraction will be a, an incentive to allow folks to come and uh, invest in it. So I'm just trying to well. picture what, yeah. how this takes shape, say, in the next five, ten years for the industry, when, assuming, speaking hypothetically yeah. now, that all goes well. These yeah. guys come in, they have the, the, the required expertise and mm. technical skills, et cetera. Well, how, does, how, do, how will things change? Oh, it's good. I mean, it's going to be, I, I, see, I see a bright light at the end of the tunnel because, first and foremost, there's going to be, we're going to build capacity. Yeah. You know, we're going to have more companies that are operating gas processing facilities. We're going to have more infrastructure to be able to tie the gas to the market because flared gas is actually gas that is stranded. There's no access between the um, to the to the market from the source of production of the of the of the of the gas. Mm -hmm. So most companies that are going to invest in this project are going to bring facilities to the flare to the flare source, process it there, and then build infrastructure to be able to pipe or deliver the gas to the market or to the consumption centers. So clearly there's going to be a lot of activities in that space. Okay. Yeah. I want us to talk about, quickly talk about, I mean, how we're, how uh, some other African producers and how, you know, they're responding to market dynamics, etc. But I want to, I, I feel I need to bring, quickly bring this up. No, as an industry uh, participant, uh, as you know, we're still waiting on the new Minister of State for Petroleum. Yeah. And I know that many uh, market players are just waiting for, you know, obviously we need someone at the, at the helm of affairs to provide direction for the market, uh, uh, as, et cetera. But I'm just wondering, what are your expectations? And what are the expectations of the sector in terms of how this new person is going to drive some perhaps outstanding issues uh, that, you know, are required where decisions are urgently needed to be taken mm -hmm. to drive the industry forward? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, what Nigerians are, eagerly waiting, the industry players are waiting for the announcement of who the petroleum minister is going to be. You know, we don't know if it's going to be a Ministry of State or a full... Uh, or whether um, President Buhari will continue in that capacity, Precisely so. Okay. But one thing we all need to understand is that the go government is a continuum. There is no break in transmission yeah. as far as governance is concerned. So the ministry is still functioning. There's a permanent secretary that's the highest ranking um, civil servant in the ministry. So it's just a matter of uh, having the policies. Mm. The policy framework is there. And the minister, whoever the person is he or she is going to come, come in there to essentially, you know, marshal the affairs of the industry. So, I mean, like, the expectations are, are high, but I would say that, you know, the roadmap to delivering on value, you know, for Nigerians is pretty much going to be the same yeah. as it's where. Okay. The, 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 the outgone uh, minister, minister of state, I think, I mean, the flare gas program was part of his own initiatives, and I think that uh, he's done an uh, commendable. You think it leaves uh, good, some good legacies behind? Absolutely. On, 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 on my scorecard, on SP scorecard, for instance, I think we think he's, he's done a fantastic job. Yeah. Now, yeah. Speaking about delivering value, I mentioned yeah. earlier that I wanted us to talk about you know, other African players, likes yeah. of Angola. We're now seeing, I mean, even East Africa emerging. Yeah. I know constantly when we're talking about yeah. how Nigeria needs to 
uh, get its act together and bring in those yeah. much needed investments while all of that is happening, while you know those calls are happening, mm -hmm. other African countries are stepping up their game. So I'm yeah. just wondering, is that a big concern for you in terms of you know how these uh, other African countries are using, uh, uh, applying innovation technology and just you know stepping up? Yeah, I, I think it's it's all about unlocking the business environment. You know, Africa is one. Is a, I mean, it's a, it's a continent. We all are Africans. You know, in fact, the last time I checked, Nigerian service companies are already getting into the likes of Tanzania, Kenya, and uh, Sudan, even Uganda. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, but on the grand scheme of things, right? It's um, it's a wake up call because those smaller fries, right, are beginning to show the kind of entrepreneurial endeavors. That is going. That's trying to push the envelope, you know, and uh, knocking on the doors that uh, the big guys like Angola and Nigeria have occupied uh, up until now. And what they're doing is they're having a strategy, a, ta a targeted strategy, you know, for looking at the renewables, you know, component of the energy mix. And that is where I think we, as a nation, have to pay tremendous amount of attention to. Otherwise, we're going to, you know, get ourselves knocked off our feet without us knowing. So it's is a, it looking we, more likely that that could, I mean, yeah, could we, we, be a missed opportunity? I, for I mentioned earlier on that the energy mix is shifting, right? Okay. The oil and gas still has a place in there, you know, but it's, it's a dynamic process and things are going to change continually over the next 20 to 30 years. So as a, as a country, we need to have a renewable energy strategy to be able to keep ourselves positioned for this wind of change that is going to come regardless. But do you, yeah. I mean, do you, looking into the future, do you still see Nigeria and the African continent, continent retaining that, you know, its leadership position as yeah. the number one? Absolutely. Or, Ab or abs abs absolutely. Yeah, because at least I, I, I say that with full confidence because uh, I, I'm a member of the Society of Petroleum Engineers and we, I mean, we, we the, the talent pool we have in Nigeria, you know, as far as petroleum engineers, it's, 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 it's tremendous, you know, and I know that, uh, and I'm pretty confident that, you know, Nigerians are innovative. We have a young generation of engineers that are beginning to take over because the older population are retiring, right? So we're having a crew change, you know, and uh, the, the techies, you know, are the ones that are sliding into positions now. And uh, from what I saw and uh, what I listened to in the conversations that happened in the last three days in our conference, it's clear that the industry is prepared, right, you know, for this uh, uh, wind of change as it were. Okay, speaking yeah. about wind of change, we only yeah. have three minutes left, uh, okay. by the way. I just yeah. wanted to hear your thoughts, perspective on how yeah. things are developing or, or evolving at international oil market. Oil prices are down to somewhere around $58 per barrel. Of course, we know that yeah. you're aware of that. Those uh, tensions uh, yeah. around the Strait of Hormuz, uh, yeah. Iran, season ships, and you know the whole trade war impacting on international yeah. oil prices. How are you, Prisa, how are you interpreting these events? No, I mean, it, it, the situation in Iran is actually it's, it's a geopolitical uh, um, situation where it's not it's nothing new to us in the industry. It's happened in the past. Even in Nigeria, you know, there was a time that events in Nigeria could trigger off uh, instability in the oil price. You know, but people have. I, I want to talk more from the point of view of the cyclical nature that people have always opined about okay. the industry. That has seems to be a thing of the past, where you said, okay, there is an oil price crash. Eventually, maybe after ten years, there's going to be a cycle that is going to repeat itself again. Now, there's a factor, you know, going on in North America, which is the shale oil production. Now, shale oil is actually disrupting, you know, this theory about the cyclical oil price. So most of these shale oil producers have now introduced innovative technology to reduce the cost of production of shale oil. So in effect, shale oil might become, com I mean, competitive with conventional oil. And what that means is that OPEC, as a cartel, may not even be able to control or dictate, you know, the flavor of or the, 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 the value of mm -hmm. what the oil price is going to tell. You know, Iran apart, Iran is geopolitical. It's not going to happen, it's not going to remain forever, you know, but we need to look at some of these um, economic indices in terms of how the forces of demand and supply brought about by, you know, more shale oil in the market is going to cost in terms of... Um, it's, 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 it's interesting you mention you say that yeah. about OPEC because well, I mean right now we see forty percent they're still the yeah. still the uh, yeah. major controlling force as it yeah. were and I'm just I'm just thinking I mean looking down I mean people could keep asking the question how relevant is OPEC yeah. is, will re OPEC still be relevant 10, 20 years down yeah. the line I mean how do you answer that question Well, it's a, it's a difficult one to answer you know uh, the um, I, I gave a, a presentation a couple of years ago you know where I did some research and I found out that look. OPEC is almost, I mean, the, the, there was a, I can't remember the oil minister of one of the OPEC countries 
who, produce, who predicted that there was going to be an uh, increase in oil price. And of course, the guys in North America just laughed about it. They pumped more oil in the market, right? And uh, of course, there was boom, the price came down. You know, so I'm saying that they will be relevant, you know, as a body, you know, but would they be able to control or have their, 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 their grip on the oil price? Will it be able to last the way it has been over the last 40 years or thereabouts? I doubt it. Hmm. I doubt it. You know, so I mean, it's um, otherwise we will be seeing, uh, we, we, we will probably have seen them controlling the quota to be able to beef up the oil price. Well, right they've been now, trying the to do price, that with quotas. I mean, and yeah. the quota system appears to be working, Pre even yeah. though for a country like Nigeria, obviously we still yeah. have ambitions to increase. Pre yeah. increase but, but the price has oscillated at $60 for several months now. Yeah. You know, otherwise, uh, if OPEC okay. has showed his face like he used to do in the past, we'll have seen a different picture. Debo, we're going to have to leave yeah. it there. Thank you so much for talking to us today. Thank Pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you. I've been speaking to Debo Fagbam. He's a chairman of the Nigerian Council of the Society of Petroleum Engineers, looking at the future of Nigeria's oil and gas industry. That's it on Beyond Markets. Thank you so much for being a part of it. Remember that you can watch all previous episodes of Beyond Markets on our website, it's cnbcafrica.com. You can also stay engaged with the hashtag Beyond Markets, and you can send your thoughts and comments to my Twitter handle too. It's at Esther O. Awoni. From myself and the team, it's bye for now.